Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Northwest Veg and two of our event sponsors, the Oregonian and Book Publishing Company, thank you for coming to Veg Fest and attending Vegan Diets for Cats and Dogs, Risks and Benefits by Dr. Mighty May. Our Mighty May is a vegan animal advocate and house call veterinarian for dogs and cats in Los Angeles. She obtained her Doctor of Veterinary Medicine degree from UC Davis. After graduating from veterinary school, Dr. May spent time working at a 24-hour emergency dog and cat hospital in Los Angeles. She then became certified in veterinary acupuncture and started a house call practice for dogs and cats. As a practicing veterinarian, Dr. May educates people about preventative medicine as well as holistic options that exist for treating their companions animals ailments. Please welcome Dr. May. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. Thank you for coming to my talk. I've noticed that the colorful costumes in the convention center remind me of West Hollywood on Halloween night. <laughs> it's great to be around so many like-minded people who want to make this world a more compassionate place for all beings. This topic is of particular importance because we are trying to improve our diets lessen our carbon footprint in healthy animals by being vegan in our own lives. But it turns out this can also be applied in many cases to our animal companions, our dogs and cats. There are some things to be aware of, and I'm going to go into detail about those in my talk today. But I think it's, it's time to extend our veganism to the extent feasible to our animal companions, where it's healthy to do so. This also can have health benefits, especially for dogs in many cases. How many of you here have dogs at home? A lot of you, great, and what about cats? All right, I also have two cats at home, Sally and Betty. <laughs> so I'm gonna start off talking about dogs and some of the health benefits that a well-balanced, nutritionally complete vegan diet can have for dogs. There's a clipboard going around where you can write down your name and email for me to send you some information. So feel free to um, sign up on that so you get the email. And that will have all the information that I'm talking about right now so you don't have to frantically copy everything down that I'm saying. So with dogs, a lot of the skin problems that I'm seeing in my clinical practice have to do with allergies. And there are three main categories of allergies that affect dogs and cats. And those are flea allergy, food allergy, and environmental allergy, also known as atopy. With flea allergy being one of the more common sources of skin allergies in our animal companions, we definitely want to rule that out, meaning eliminate it as a possibility when we're trying to figure out why an animal is scratching, itching, biting, licking, so looking for evidence of flea dirt by combing with a flea comb, seeing those little black specks in the rump area, particularly where the fleas like to hang out, that's important. And getting a good flea control medication on board, such as Comfortis, which is a newer medicine that's given by mouth once a month with a full meal to help protect fleas, protect against fleas. So once fleas have been ruled out as a cause for a dog's itching, the next step is to rule out food allergy. And it turns out that a lot of animals are allergic to beef, chicken, or dairy. And a vegan diet can actually provide great relief for these animals. They're oftentimes licking their paws, chewing, biting, and it's a year-round nuisance. You'll even see salivary staining, which is a brown discoloration of their forepaws and their hind paws from the constant licking that they're doing. So what I would suggest, if you're gonna do the, the vegan trial, is over the course of a week or two, gradually transition them to the vegan food by increasing the proportion of the vegan food, decreasing the proportion of the meat-based food until after a two-week period, they're completely on the vegan food. And then commence an eight-week food elimination trial where they're only eating that vegan food exclusively for an eight-week minimum period, even up to 12 weeks, ideally to really test it out thoroughly. And then you'll know if after that eight to 12 week period of time, they're improved in terms of their skin tone health, that they do in fact have some food allergy going on. 
If you don't notice any improvement, on the other hand, it's possible there's some other allergy going on. It could be environmental allergy. And that could be anything from grass to pollens, molds, all sorts of plant particles from various trees in the environment. And it gets pretty tricky to try to identify them unless you do a blood allergy test, which would be one of the next diagnostic steps that your veterinarian can help you through to find out what is causing the dog to itch and scratch so much. The other health benefits that can come with a vegan diet for dogs is a healthier, slimmer body weight. And these days we're seeing really high rates of obesity in our animal companions, and it's becoming a, a big problem for their health to have the extra weight carrying on. They're putting more pressure on their joints, they're at an increased risk for diabetes, and it decreases their longevity to be overweight or obese. So if you have a medium to large breed dog who's obese, then a healthy rate of weight loss would be about half a pound to a pound of body weight per week. And the way you can achieve this is by cutting back by 25% of their regular food and replacing that with some steamed vegetables like green beans, carrots, spinach, other green vegetables that they'll eat and therefore giving them more satiety with the fiber-rich, phytonutrient-rich vegetables so they don't stay hungry uh, on a lower calorie regimen. But if they're on a vegan diet, you may find that the weight comes off more readily anyway. So that's again one of the benefits. Another benefit of the vegan diet is that they're not being exposed to the 4D meat, which is dead, dying, disabled, and diseased meat from animals that are diseased. They're dying from, in some cases, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, that's a prion disease, also known as mad cow disease, that is not destroyed by high temperatures. And when you read those labels that say byproducts on the ingredient label, it could mean spinal cord, all sorts of diseased lesions that would not even be fit for human consumption. Not that anyone in this room is going to be eating that but it's still a concern for our animal companions. So getting rid of the risk for bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Also reducing the risk for certain degenerative diseases such as cancer, heart disease, kidney disease, arthritis. It's been shown that it tends to be lower in dogs that are on a, a whole foods vegan diet. There haven't been extensive studies done because it's hard to really compare uh, diets in the long run without having adequate control groups. But there's anecdotal evidence to support that, certainly. So when you have your dog on a vegan diet, you should observe health benefits with their skin coat health, especially if they're allergic to beef or chicken or dairy. Um, less commonly, there may be dogs that are allergic to wheat or soy. And in those cases, you can either find a gluten-free formula, such as the one V-Dog makes that is here at the VegFest. They have a gluten-free, GMO-free, soy-free kibble for dogs, and it meets all their nutritional requirements. Another option is to make a homemade diet. That does take more time and consideration of the full nutrients that dogs need to be healthy and thrive. So if you're going to do that, I would recommend going to a website called balanceit.com that will give you the resources to formulate your own diet for your, your dog. There are also recipe books you can uh, order. Uh, for, uh, there's a website called vegetariandogs.com where you can order this book that gives recipes that have things like lentils and rice, oats, and the right proportions so you are giving the right balance of the nutrients they need. Some of the risks that could happen associated with a vegan diet that also need to be considered are more breed specific in general, but one of the things that can happen on a vegan diet is the urine becomes more alkaline. So in certain breeds, they can develop crystals because of this in their urine. And if left untreated, these crystals can actually turn into bladder stones, which is a real big problem. They have to have surgery, a cystotomy, to remove those bladder stones unless they're dissolved. But that usually is problematic in other ways. So it's really 
much preferable to prevent it from happening um, to begin with by monitoring the urine. And the way to do that is to start off before switching to the vegan diet with a baseline urinalysis. Take your dog to the vet, have your urinalysis done. It's a routine, simple test. And then you'll know what the pH is, if there are any crystals, if there's bacteria, white blood cells, red blood cells. It gives just an overall view of the urine. And then about three weeks after switching to the vegan diet, take your dog in again and have another urinalysis done so you can have a comparison from before. That way you'll know if the dog is predisposed to developing crystals. Another thing that would help prevent them from forming is feeding a moist diet. The more liquid the dog consumes, the more fluid will be able to dilute out the urine so the urine is less concentrated and therefore less likely to have crystals form to begin with. There are certain breeds of dogs that you have to be more careful with when it comes to these urinary crystals that, like I said, can turn into stones if left untreated. And those are Bichon Frisés, Miniature Schnauzers, Miniature Poodles, Lhasa Apsos, and Cocker Spaniels. That doesn't mean that other breeds can't have crystals or stones form, but those are the breeds that are more prone to these issues. There are also certain breeds of dogs that can develop a condition called dilated cardiomyopathy, which is a form of heart disease that has to do with insufficient taurine and or carnitine in the diet. And those are traditionally amino acids found in flesh foods, but they can be supplied in synthetic form and they can be supplemented to the diet if there is a concern of possible deficiency in those nutrients. So the breeds that you have to be careful with when it comes to taurine and carnitine are Cocker Spaniels again, and then the giant breed dogs, which are Doberman Pinschers, St. Bernard's, Afghan Hounds, Scottish Deer Hounds, Irish Wolf Hounds, as well as Boxers. So if you have one of those dogs, then you, you want to be more vigilant when it comes to those things, and perhaps prophylactically, meaning preventively, give them the, the taurine and carnitine in the diet. Some diets already have the taurine in them. It's not an absolute requirement for all dogs the way it is for cats but it, it can be something that becomes an issue in those certain breeds that are prone to the dilated cardiomyopathy. As I mentioned earlier, cancer has become an increasing concern as well in our animal companions. We've seen over the last 40 years drastic increases in the incidence of cancers such as lymphosarcoma, hemiangiosarcoma, even benign tumors such as lipomas, which are fatty tumors, have increased dramatically. And one can attribute that to a number of factors. We can't identify them all specifically, but certainly uh, the food is a major factor. And I think that the, the processing the food goes through, the fact that a lot of the meat-based commercially available diets have byproducts, which are slaughterhouse rejects that would not be fit for human consumption or getting into the pet food, are definitely a contributor to this. So if we care about our animals' health as well as the animals in the farms that are, are being inhumanely treated and slaughtered needlessly, a vegan diet can really be a good option all around, especially for dogs. Now for cats, it's a little bit trickier because they are obligate carnivores. And in nature, they do eat animals. They, they catch prey. But we've domesticated them, just as we have dogs. And since they're in our care, it's not the same as being in the wild. So to, to compare it to what the natural situation is doesn't take into account the fact that we're taking our animals to the veterinarian for medical care, we're providing regular meals for them. So this is not necessarily part of a natural existence for you know, a feral cat. And I've done a lot of work with feral cat Bay neuter trap return uh, organizations helping. And I've seen feral cats that have been in really awful condition, uh, terrible hair coats, immune problems, uh, weight loss, uh, parasites like you wouldn't believe. And so it's not like this fantasy world of everything is wonderful out there in the wild where everything's natural. They, they still have problems in the wild. In fact, sometimes more so than, oftentimes more so than they would as uh, well cared for in the, the home environment as companions for us. 
So I think those comparisons don't quite add up when people make claims that a carnivorous diet is, is better just because it's more natural. Uh, it doesn't take into account the, the carbon footprint, the ethical issues of feeding one animal to another um, when there is an alternative. That being said, there are issues when it comes to vegan diets for cats, especially certain cats that, that can be prone to crystal formation. Now, with dogs, as I mentioned, crystals can occur, and it, it can be remedied if caught in time uh, using dilution of the urine with fluids or urinary acidifiers. With cats, however, especially male cats, if their crystals are not being treated, they can actually cause a life-threatening condition called urinary blockage or urethral obstruction, meaning that their urethra becomes blocked and they're unable to urinate. It is a life-threatening emergency and it requires immediate veterinary intervention, which includes catheterizing the cat to relieve the obstruction, giving them IV fluid therapy, because a lot of times they're really azotemic at that point, meaning they're blood, urea, nitrogen, and creatinine have skyrocketed, meaning the toxins are building up in their bloodstream, and they are literally dying because there's so much toxic material building up in their bloodstream. Unless it's caught in time, they can recover. I've seen many cats recover from this, but it's a very nerve-wracking thing for both the guardian, of course, painful for the cat, and costly for your pocketbook. So if we can prevent that, it's so much better. One way to do that is to monitor the urine and to make sure that if the urine pH becomes too alkaline, then acidifying agents can be added, fluid can be added, so that we alleviate that problem. There are some cats who are very finicky eaters, and that is another problem that can come up. So if that happens, you want to be very patient in the way you transition them. You want to gradually transition them over a couple of weeks or even longer. In some cases, withholding food for a single day may be enough motivation to stimulate hunger in the cat to get him or her to eat the food, but you do not want to have a cat going off food for an extended period of time. That is very risky for their health, especially if they're overweight because they can actually go into a condition called hepatic lipidosis or fatty liver syndrome, which is very dangerous for them and they can end up in the hospital, uh, again, with fluids and expensive veterinary treatment required to get them back to a state of health. So if they just go on a hunger strike and refuse to eat the food, then it's time to either switch them back or do a more gradual transition to the plant-based food. So there, there are some prescription diets that are out there that can help with the urinary crystals when they form. Hill's Science Diet makes a product called CD, which is often prescribed when the cats develop these struvite crystals. And unfortunately, Hill's does have byproducts as an ingredient in their food. But if it's a situation where the cat's immediate health is in danger because of the crystals, that may be a necessary thing to do in the meantime. Uh, but there are other options that can also be done if there is enough time to research them and get them started, but such as vitamin C can be added to the diet. Now that takes some time to actually acidify it enough to bring down the crystals. Also, you can give subcutaneous fluids you know, with your veterinarian's guidance, assuming that that's okay for other reasons. If, if the cat had some kind of heart condition, like a heart murmur, it may not be a good idea to do the fluids, but assuming the cat is in otherwise good enough health to be given the fluids, then that would be another option to help dilute out the urine, especially if the cat is not a big water drinker. It's really important to have enough hydration to dilute out the urine to minimize the incidence of crystals to begin with, and some cats just don't drink very much water. They can be encouraged to drink more water by having a, a water fountain, a flowing water fountain, or another way would be to add a little tiny pinch of salt to the food, stimulate thirst, and then just adding water to the food itself, like warm water uh, soaked either on kibble, if that's the way it's being ordered because it's cheaper that way than buying canned food, 
or even canned food having water added to it like a, until it becomes a soupy consistency and then they're naturally taking in more water when they're taking in their food. So uh, some of the other things I just wanted to mention, a lot of people have come to me regarding the issues they've dealt with with their veterinarians and some people say their veterinarians are not willing to let them or advocate that they continue to feed these vegetarian or vegan diets to their animal companions and there's, there's definitely a challenge there and sometimes they don't even feel like being open with their vet about what they're actually feeding. And it's unfortunate that that's the case, but I think that if you show that you're knowledgeable about the issues and, and the potential issues and risks associated with these diets, as well as the benefits of them, then you'll come across as more informed yourself. And if you explain the reasons why it's important to you, then hopefully they'll be more receptive to that. Uh, if you find that they just are not at all open to it or tolerant of you having your animal on the vegan food or at least somewhat a vegan food, then you know maybe better to search for another veterinarian who is because I think having a good relationship with your vet is important to be able to care for your animal the best that you can. And you know if, if you need to contact another vet who's out of the area, uh, such as myself, you know, I'm also available to do email and phone consultations from a distance, but I can't diagnose or treat your animal over the phone or over the email without, you know, seeing them and actually looking at all the different things going on. But if records are faxed or emailed, then, you know, that can be helpful in putting the pieces of the puzzle together. With dogs, a lot of times people have been told that they're carnivores, but actually they are omnivores. and. There have been recent studies that have shown that they have the ability to digest carbohydrates a lot better than wolves do. So the, when they split from wolves, they adapted the ability to digest carbohydrates being domesticated, living with humans. And so they're really much better off with a balanced diet. I've, I've heard of all these alternative diets that are kind of fads being promoted, such as a raw, barf diet as it's called which stands for bones and raw food but it's really not the best diet because not only is there an issue of parasites from the salmonella and e coli contamination in the food but also bones can perforate the intestine and it can be a life-threatening emergency if that happens plus there's also the problem of people handling it and then in the kitchen being exposed potentially to hazardous parasites because of not keeping the, the kitchen, uh, set the separate uh, utensils and cutting board and stuff from the non-hazardous food that's not this raw meat. So, you know, those things are often promoted or grain-free, I've even heard that that's becoming more popular. A lot of people think that that's better, but most dogs don't even have grain allergies. It's just one of these fads that is promoted. If you do a food elimination trial and you happen to eliminate that one grain and you find an improvement, great, that may be a few cases out there where the dogs are allergic to grains, but by and large, the majority of them are allergic to meat protein or these other uh, animal source proteins. So if we can get them successfully transitioned to a vegan diet and alleviate that, it may be that there are other components that are contributing to the allergies, such as environmental issues then you know, it's, it's still going to help improve their overall health and, and quality of life to have that in their, um, in their regimen, in their treatment. So part of treating the allergies is improving their diet. Another thing to look out for when you're looking at pet food labels is to see that it's AFCO approved. AFCO is uh, the American Association of Feed Control Officials, and they're a governing body that looks at all the nutrient profiles of a pet food to make sure that it meets the nutritional requirements of that species. So if it has a, the right amount of protein, carbohydrates, fiber, it, it's going to have it all listed there and it'll say AFCO approved. So the vegan diets that are made specifically for dogs and cats are AFCO approved. There are a couple of ones that have had some issues in the past. There was a study um, on a vegan cat food brand or two vegan cat food brands back in 2004, which showed that 
there were two cans that actually came up deficient in some nutrients, unfortunately, but they only had checked this one sample. And it was unfortunate that that happened because it kind of made it look bad to the community at large that this vegan company or vegan pet food company isn't doing a proper job of formulating their food. Uh, one of the companies involved in that study did find where the error was occurring. It was a mixing error in the manufacturing process, not in the formula itself. But uh, unfortunately, the other company that was involved in this study that also was found to be deficient did not take as much of a corrective action in response to this finding. And it's still unclear how much has improved with respect to quality control measures since that point. But uh, there's another veterinarian, uh, Dr. Laura Lee Lake Wakefield, who conducted a study on vegetarian cats or diets um, for cats that are on vegan diets versus non-vegan diets. And or, or she has a website, vegetariancats.com. And she actually found that even though some of the cats had borderline low levels of B12 and taurine, it wasn't low enough to warrant clinical problems, luckily. Um, the clinical problems that would happen in a cat who didn't have enough taurine would be blindness as well as heart problems. And obviously, we don't want to have that happen. So if there is a concern about inadequate taurine for whatever reason, then you can do a blood taurine test. It's a little costly, though. So I would recommend that people contact these companies and hold them to task to make sure that they're doing proper quality control measures, that they're attending these details, because we have to be our own checks and balance systems. If we don't, it's going to end up backfiring in the end. And we don't want to project a negative image on the vegan movement by having these incidents where people are not feeding a proper diet and then animal gets sick. So it's, it is important to keep those things in mind. I mean, I've had my cats on the evolution diet, uh, which, which is the one that did, apparently didn't take the corrective action, although it, it's still subject to inquiry what all happened with that. But they've been doing fine. And they're both female cats for the more. But if you, know, if you have a male cat, you definitely want to be more vigilant with checking the urine to make sure they're not getting crystals. Because once they get crystals, they could obstruct. It you know, hopefully wouldn't happen. There are some cats that have crystals and they don't obstruct. But you're not going to be able to know if that's your cat or, or another cat. Um, you know, the, the other thing people object to is the cost involved of ordering this food because it does add up. If you order the dry food, it's less expensive, but then you're feeding a dry diet and then there's more chance of problems with the crystals forming because it's less moisture in the diet. But if you add water to the food, then that, that's alleviated. If you can team up with someone else in your area who's also feeding the vegan food, you can actually save money that way doing a bulk order. Or you can make the food from scratch, and there's a company called Harbingers of a New Age that's headed up by James Peden that has a supplement base you can order from their website, which is veggiepet.com, V-E-G-E-P-E-T.com. And from that supplement mix, you can actually make the kibble at home with homemade ingredients, and it lasts for three weeks or so. So it's not actually that much effort, and then you'll save some money that way. So does anyone have any questions? Miyoko, yes. What was the name of that website again, Veggie what? Veggie Pet, it's V-E-G-E. PET.com. And if you sign up on my sign up sheet, I'll send the links to you as well for those sites. Yes? I, I'm curious what percentage of a meat based diet for cats would help alleviate the crystallization of the urine? What percentage of meat in the diet would alleviate the crystallization in the urine? That's an excellent question. It's like if a cat is a mouser, just naturally, uh -huh. they're indoor outdoor they might be getting some of that over right. the diet. Yeah, I think that for cats that are taking their own prey in addition to what you're feeding them, that, that will acidify naturally to some degree. And if you're feeding like a 50-50 of vegan and non-vegan, then that will alleviate it on its own. But ultimately, every cat's an individual. And even though it's a relatively small percentage of cats, maybe about 10 to 15%, that'll have this kind of problem, 
you want to know in advance if yours is one of those 15%. But if it's a situation like, like you're managing a feral cat colony and it's just not feasible to take the cats in for urine checks, then I would suggest doing like a 50-50 if you're going to try that rather than risking obstruction in a, in a male cat. In a female cat, they can still develop issues because the crystal's forming, but it, it wouldn't be a life-threatening emergency all at once, you know, taking you by surprise because, because of their anatomy, they're not prone to blockage, but they could still develop crystals and even stones if something was persisting. So it's still a good idea to have it checked. Did you have a follow-up question about that? Yeah, I was just wondering if for the urinalysis, do you recommend the same as for dogs or on a more constant, ongoing basis? It would depend on the cat's initial set of urinalyses, what frequency would be considered the bare minimum to have some level of confidence that everything would be all right. And so, I mean, I have clients whose cats, even male cats, have been on a vegan diet for several years and have been fine, especially if they give them moist food and, and in some cases with some acidification added either through the vitamin C or Harbinger's of a new age has a pH adjusted formula which has methionine which is an acidifier. So once you get them stabilized and you can check it again in a couple of months and just make sure that they're holding steady, then I would say that biannually or annually getting it checked just to make sure. And then of course if any symptoms arise such as inappropriate urination, blood in the urine, straining, anything like that, they should definitely get checked out sooner. Yes? Um, I'm just curious if the urinalysis for cats and dogs is like an expensive process? Is it expensive? Well, I guess it's all relative on you know what your budget is, but typically it runs about $40, $45 for a urinalysis. If you find that to be too much and you want to try to do it a cheaper way, you can get pH strips and try to collect the sample at home, and then you'd at least know what the pH is, but you wouldn't know if they're crystals just from that. But if, if you had already determined previously that there weren't, and you were just kind of trying to get a, a gauge for whether it was likely, you know, that, that would be kind of a, perhaps slightly less accurate, but still somewhat clued in a way to know. So you recommend doing a year analysis prior to changing it, and then maybe eight weeks yeah, we, well, I recommend getting the urinalysis prior and then about three weeks after switching because by that point you would know if the diet is having an effect. I mean, if, if you notice, as, as in some cases I have, like the first urinalysis, let's say the pH is 7 and there are no crystals. And then the second urinalysis, the pH is 8 and there are crystals. And the crystals that are going to be seen are called strulite crystals, also known as ammonium magnesium phosphate crystals. That's the type of crystal that forms in an alkaline urine pH. There are also crystals that are formed in an acidic urine pH. So therein lies, again, the importance of getting the baseline urine done because there are some dogs, especially, and even cats, that could develop too acidic of a urine and have the opposite type of crystal and consequent stone. So it's not just a one-size-fits-all approach. So that's why it's not really something I can say a standard formula. If you just follow these exact steps, you're going to be fine. It, it, if it were that simple, then I wouldn't have had to go to the veterinary school and you know work as hard as I did to get my degree. But you know every case is a little different. So I would definitely consult with a vet when you're going to embark on that. And if they're not receptive to it, I can talk to the vet and see if they're willing to be open to it or you can reach out to me or some other vegan vets or at least vets who are willing to work with you on this uh, because you don't want to just be completely doing it on your own. Um, at least initially, you want to have some, some solid information via the urinalysis. And if you really don't want to tell them about what you're feeding your pet, I mean, you can just go in and say, oh, you know, I want to get a senior panel done, which is blood work and urinalysis. And then, oh, I want to see a copy of the results. And then, you call me up and say, Dr. May, can I have your help interpreting these results? The ideal thing is to have that open communication with your vet, though. Miyoko. Um, are you, is there a network of vegan vets, and is, do you have some sort of list of vegan vets in various areas? Yeah, I wish there was a more organized list of vegan vets. I think it's, it's definitely something that would be nice to have 
compiled. I know there's a Facebook list of vegan vets, which I'm a part of, and I know there are various vegan vets that I'm aware of in different areas. There's Dr. Andrew Knight, who is in London, Dr. Laura Lee Wakefield, who's in New York somewhere, I forget exactly, she does house calls out there. Uh, Dr. Deborah Volgaris, who's another vegan vet in the Santa Monica, LA area, near where I live. And, and there are various others scattered about, but we don't really have a, a coalition or a coalesced, concentrated uh, presence in any particular place. Uh, I wish there, there was something like that, and hopefully in the future there will be, but you can, you can always like look online to see too if they're members of the Humane Society or the Medical Association, or if they're active in animal welfare issues like um, banning, declawing, which there, there are a lot of vets who've been helping to get that banned, and I was part of the effort to get it banned in certain cities in California back in 2009, so those are probably the types of veterinarians who would be at least more receptive to this, but it's still a pretty controversial issue, especially when it comes to cats, so you still have to kind of um, feel your way around with that. Yeah. Yes? I was just gonna say, I have a cat, a male cat, who I, it was a rescue, and he has a history of crystals. And he actually, actually cured him by putting him on the um, vegan diet, the pH adjusted one through Harbingers of a New Age. Oh, great. I got really lazy and um, read, didn't get the ingredients, and so he went off of it for three days. Uh -huh. And I had to bring him to the vet, he had crystals. Wow. So the, the, it actually cured his his problem. Before they were having, he put him on CD, and uh -huh. I didn't want to, like he would bark it up. Right. It just wasn't, it was gross and stunk and it was a key. So. And then um, I guess my question is, uh, do you feel like uh, digestive enzymes are a necessary thing for, particularly for cats whose maybe systems are more um, geared towards digesting meat? If they're on a vegan diet, do you think that's something that would be important or helpful for them to have? Or do you think Digestive enzymes for cats, that's a good question. I haven't needed that for my cats or the patients I've treated that were cats on vegan diets, but it, it could be important for some cats that are prone to problems with their digestion, especially if they're having issues or had history of upset stomach or you know, vomiting or diarrhea or even pancreatitis that you know might be a good idea to have just in general so if if that's the case there there are pet specific or veterinary specific um, enzymes that it can be added to the food there's also for those who are interested in a homemade food there's a, a website called petkelp.com that has different supplement mixes you can add to the food to make it nutritionally complete and they have a, a skin coat formula that has a flax seed in addition to the kelp. And the kelp has a wide range of nutrients. It's really a good thing to add to, to invigorate their overall uh, nutritional profile. And then they have one that's more wellness that has blueberries for the antioxidants. So that's petkelp.com. Yeah. yeah. I, I was wondering if there are any other major issues to watch out for uh, for cats transitioning them to a vegan diet, aside from so aside from crystals in cats, the other issue that I would watch out for would be weight loss and possibly hepatic lipidosis because some cats are just going to turn their noses up at it and they won't eat. And if you have multiple cats in your house, it will maybe not be as detectable that they're not eating as much. They might just kind of hang out in the corner and not eat as much or eat so little that they're wasting away. So monitoring their weight, um, being observant of their eating habits, like seeing that they're at least maintaining a steady body weight, that's important to do. Yes, you in the blue shirt. <laughs> um, this is sort of a testimonial, and then I have a question. Sure. Um, uh, my family, we've had um, German Shepherds, and most of them have developed cancer around the age of seven. Mm. Well, I have two German Shepherds who are now um, 
eight and a half and nine and a half. And I put them on a vegan diet two years ago. And what I noticed was that they seem to have more energy and they, you know, they love the food. There's no problem. So, um, so I've gone past that terrible seven age, which, um, so, but I might, so my testimonial is that I believe it works. And right. I believe that the uh, chances of them getting cancer, uh, I would think drastically reduced because they're not getting all that meat um, crap. Uh, so my question though is, one of my dogs does have low thyroid that we just detected. Mm -hmm. Would um, veg vegan diet have anything to do with that or is that just that she has low thyroid? Are you saying the low thyroid condition was diagnosed after? Yeah, it's just like, a, well I had, a, I don't see any evidence of it, but I just had them both um, went in for a senior blood work and all that a couple of weeks ago and, uh -huh. and my female, they detected that, which also detected very high levels of uh, uh, triglycerides, which they say often is because of low thyroid. High triglycerides and low T4 or thyroid hormone yeah. are both consistent with hypothyroidism. In a borderline case, a dog who may be not showing all the clinical signs of hypothyroidism would benefit from what's called a free T4, which is a blood test that's added on when the T4 is kind of in the gray zone or just slightly low. Yeah. And yeah. so if, if the dog is sluggish, lethargic, gaining weight for no obvious reason, they're not just being fed all day long, they're just literally eating a reasonable portion that's still gaining weight, or they're having like a poor hair coat, those are the telltale signs of hypothyroidism. So if two or more of those characteristics are noticed, then it's pretty suspicious for hypothyroidism, but you still want to have that free T4 add-on to confirm it if the T4 is just slightly low. I'm not sure of any specific correlation between diet and hypothyroidism, at least not that I've seen in studies done. And it, there could also be genetic predispositions to that too, you know, depending on the breed, but we still don't know all the, the factors that cause hypothyroidism. In cats, hyperthyroidism, which is, is generally the thyroid disorder that cats get when they get a thyroid disorder, is hyperthyroidism manifested by weight loss in the face of a ravenous appetite has been correlated with exposure to flame retardants because in the last couple of decades, a lot of furniture has flame retardants in it, sofas and carpets too. And, and they spend a lot of time hanging out in those areas and they get exposed to it that way. So it's, it's an issue, it even affects people. So it's part of the problem of, of living in our modern world with all the chemicals we're exposed to, unfortunately. Yes? Uh, uh, we have a, a cat now who's several years old. As a kitten, he was a rescue, of course. Uh, he was fed, um, Phil Science died at the shelter, and he doesn't drink. When we got him home a few weeks later, he developed really bad crystals. What I did at that time to push them through is not only we added a lot of fluid to his diet, I got cranberry powder, and I gave him cranberry powder to knock it out. He's five years old now, he's fine. He's not vegan, but he eats a lot of veggies, and rice, and potato skins, and uh -huh. all kinds of stuff. But that's, that's what we did, is we had not only added water to his canned food, uh, but we, well, I gave him cranberry powder. That's so a great that's idea. It. Yeah, the cranberry extract works well for controlling urinary crystals in conjunction with vitamin C if they're the alkaline crystals, the struvite crystals. Yes? How do you feel about most of the over-the-counter, you know, commercial vegan dog foods? Are some better than others, or? I think that there are a lot of vegan dog foods on the market, so it's a lot easier with dogs. And I mean, in a perfect world where you had time to home cook, then that would be the healthiest option. But you know, being realistic, a lot of people just don't have the time for that, and it's it's much more convenient to give a commercial vegan pet food, which I think is definitely.
superior to the meat-based foods for you know the reasons I described. So like Pet Guard even has an organic vegan formula that comes in a can. They also have a dry food which is vegetarian but not vegan, has eggs in it, I believe. And then there are other brands that have vegetarian vegan formulas like Natural Balance and Nature's Recipe. So I tend to send people to those brands as well as V Dog, of course, which V Dog is a vegan company, so I think that supporting them is also helpful to help them expand what they're doing and, and their animal rights vegan, so they're they're coming from a place of showing compassion to all beings. It's not just about selling a product to them. So they really care about what they're doing. Uh, they've come out with a breath bone product to help keep the teeth clean and smelling good and that's an alternative, a vegan alternative to the greenies, which are helpful for dental health as well. And that reminds me, I wanted to also mention that regarding dental health, traditionally it was thought, and it's still uh, somewhat helpful in a way to have dry food in terms of the dental health maintenance, but the reality is that even though the teeth would appear better with a dry food because it acts as a toothbrush in a sense, to scrape away tartar or scrape away plaque before it comes in, becomes tartar. There's still periodontal disease that can form from bacteria under the gum line that is not visible to the eyes without having a thorough cleaning. And so I would recommend people to brush their dogs and cats teeth if they tolerate it. If you have the time, that's the best thing to do. And Again, it's one of those things that a lot of people don't do it because it's, it's not easy or convenient necessarily or their animal's not accustomed to it. There are various toothpastes that are appealing to animal companions that you can get at pet stores to get them into it, use positive reinforcement to get them to cooperate. If none of that works, then you can at least give them you know, the annual teeth cleanings with your veterinarian, which generally is under anesthesia. But there are also other products you can use that help minimize the tartar from building up. Um, there's a dental water additive you can order from healthymouth.com that is put in the drinking water to help minimize tartar build up. And then the greenies or breath bones also periodically can, can be given to help minimize that. But the wet food is really better for their health, their overall systemic health. So. Yes, you in the black sweater, and then you after that. I have two, hopefully, quick questions. Okay, um, sure. One, if you do give the dog um, vegetables, should they be cooked as I would eat them, or like green beans, or can they eat more raw foods than humans can eat? So the question is about uh, vegetables being cooked versus raw. There are certain vegetables that I think are easier to digest if they're slightly steamed, at least like green beans and, and broccoli. Uh, if you give vegetables like carrots raw, I think that would be fine as long as they're in small enough chunks to where the dog will chew, will be able to digest it to some degree, even if he doesn't chew it thoroughly, because there's some dogs that are just like wolfing it down. Like that's <laughs> where that term came from, is the wolves would just swallow the food very rapidly and not necessarily digest it. So since plant material requires more chewing, more mastication, so if they don't do that, then it could cause some issues in the intestine. So uh, to answer your question, you can pretty much make it the same way. I mean, I don't know how exactly you cook, but I would lay off the spices because that could upset their stomach. But otherwise, just lightly steaming it, or you can add a little bit of oil and, and then just maybe some soy sauce, but nothing too dramatic spice-wise. The other question I had was, I had heard that feeding a dog, um, or maybe a cat too, a vegan diet made them kinder and gentler <laughs> uh, because they're not eating that meat. Is there any truth to that? That's a really interesting question. That actually reminds me of a story, which is a true story, about a lioness named Little Tyke who refused to consume anything that had even a drop of blood in it. She was a vegetarian lioness, and she was born in, in a rather strange circumstance in which her mother refused to take care of her as mothers normally do, and she was hand-raised by her human caretakers, 
and they were panicking initially because she wouldn't eat any flesh at all. Even when they put a drop of blood in this stew that they made, she wasn't vegan, she was vegetarian, she had eggs and dairy in her diet, but she absolutely refused. She turned her nose up at it unless, it, unless it was vegetarian. And she was very gentle with farmed animals like lambs and goats that resided with her and they had her um, working in some Hollywood production for a while and then she, she lived a, a pretty decent life and she was very kind towards her, her other uh, companions. So I'm not sure if that's true, that it seems like it could be. I mean, I think some suggestions along those lines have been made regarding humans on a vegan diet, so it's, it's plausible. Um, but I don't know that it's been fully explored. You haven't seen it in your practice. I don't think I've, I've seen enough to really say one way or the other. That I don't have a large enough sample size. Like I'd have to do a more broad-reaching survey of some sort, and it, it, it might be a little tricky to be objective about that. Not that objectivity is the only thing that matters, but when you're trying to get credibility in scientific journals and things like that, if the study's gonna actually be taken seriously, then that might be one of the criticisms that's levied against it if it's deemed too subjective. Thank you. Sure. Maybe too kind of in general. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really appreciate all the education you're doing for vegan dogs, and I feel like as omnivores that it can be a healthy option for them. And cats are just so difficult because we've domesticated them and taken them away from like hunting prey, but then the alternative is like feeding them cans of factory farm animals. So I've really struggled with that because I try to take good care of my cat and let him inside and outside and he hunts, mm. but not enough to do his full diet. Um, and I don't want to feed him factory farm animals, but then I do see them as carnivores. And you know, it's the, the fact that the acidity is an issue shows that their natural diet is acidic meat. And it's kind of like humans, the vegan is ideal. And it took um, humans a long time of eating meat before we realized that it caused you know, heart disease and all these other problems. So for me, it's not worth the risk for my cat to see what happens if I take it off his natural diet of meat. Yeah. But I have done some things that I feel like are um, not as bad as like mainstream food. So I'll, I won't feed him any canned beef at all. He just eats like chicken in the cans and I won't buy cans with byproducts. And the only beef he eats is um, like raw top sirloin steak that's free range. Mm -hmm. So that's been kind of my compromise, and it's not mm -hmm. ideal. You know, there's really no solution for cats who are carnivores, but it's just not worth the risk to me to, to his health, especially because he's a male, mm -hmm. and he turns up his food, he turns up his nose at any other. I've had cats my whole life, yeah. and they just, they don't want, yeah. they don't want food that's like, that I eat, like vegetables and grains, and I could try to disguise it and trick them, but it's not really their natural food. So I'm, I'm very conflicted about it, mm -hmm. but I feed him meat, and I just try to do the best I can by avoiding the byproducts and no canned beef, because it could come from 100 different cows. And you know, so I feed him the chicken or the um, like wellness formula brand chicken or fish. And I try to get the kinds of brands that you can actually see the chunks of meat. So at least it's healthier for them, but it's really just, it's very challenging to have domesticated a carnivore. Yeah, it's, it's definitely an ethical dilemma, and I know it's not feasible for every cat to be on a vegan diet. And you know, from the standpoint of the naturalness of it, that's true. That it's not their totally natural diet. But uh, I guess for me personally, I would rather not take the life of an animal if it's not necessary to do so to feed my own animal. And both of my cats are rescued. I would never support breeding animals for our own entertainment or you know companionship or what have you. And the fact that they're here with us, I still feel we have an obligation to help them and protect them and, and do right by them. Um, I also haven't had as many issues with finicky eating in my cats, luckily. But when I prepare their food, I'll sometimes sprinkle nutritional yeast, and that's an idea that people can use to help the cat be interested in the food, and also warming it gently can bring out the aromas, so those are things that, that can be tried. Um, I think ultimately, probably not too far in the future, what hopefully will be done is cloned meat cat food will be made, like 
the way they're researching it for human consumption for those people who just refuse to give up eating animals, at least there's less of an ethical problem associated with the suffering on factory farms and slaughterhouses from cloned meat if they can make that happen. And, and that would be a way to kind of alleviate that dilemma with cat nutrition. Another quick question about com Comfortis. Is that yeah. There's, I looked online and there's so many reviews that say, it killed my dog, it made my dog sick. Do you know if those, any of those are valid? Well, there, there are contraindications to Comfortis if the animal's on another medication that is not to be given with it concurrently. So I don't know about every specific case. The, all the cases that I've prescribed it have been fine. There have been, you know, perhaps some cases where it's triggered seizure activity in dogs that were also on ivermectin concurrently, and they should not have been prescribed the Comfortis. But just like with any medication, including something as benign as aspirin, there can be adverse effects in rare, rare cases. But the benefit of giving the flea control medicine and alleviating the itching, scratching, hot spots, all the, the nonstop frantic um, scratching that goes on to me outweighs the you know very tiny potential for risk, which are really largely alleviated if those uh, precautions are taken into account and fed with a full meal and things same, like that. Same for cats. Uh huh. Yeah, it's been approved for use in cats, but it should be given with a full meal. Anyone else who hasn't already asked a question? Or yes, you in the back, and then I'll get to you. chicken flavoring or you know some animal product mixed in but you, know, you can also make it um, yourself with you know adding something but I don't think if you just put it directly on top of their food they're gonna eat it because it has a sour taste yeah and sure and then in the oh okay I just want to add something that in an emergency when I've had with, with rescue cats I've actually used a syringe in water and put the powder down their throats just to get them going. Okay. So that that can be given with a syringe if, if they'll uh, yeah if they'll take it. Sure. They have no choice. They have no choice. <laughs> Hopefully, we don't get scratched up in the process. <laughs> oh, we have five minutes left. Okay. So any last questions? Miyoko, you had your hand up before, right? I, I don't know. Oh, okay. <laughs> Didn't she have more than one question? Oh, you had a second question. Okay. Thank yeah. Um, my second question is for my um, older indoor male cat. Um, I'm vegan and I would love to just try to see if I can transition him to um, a vegan diet or even incorporate that with some of the other stuff that he's eating. Are there any like vegetables that you would recommend? There are several companies that make vegan food for cats. Evolution, Harbingers of a New Age, and Amicat are the three major brands that I'm aware of. There, there were some um, issues in the past with Evolution's quality control, and I was you know, mentioning that in reference to a study done in 2004, but to my knowledge, they, they may or may not have corrected it fully adequately, but they do have taurine in diet. But as far as the pH issue with the urine, um, Harbingers of a New Age has a pH adjusted formula. So if you're trying to uh, treat that issue, it, you know, and you only would do that if they have an issue to begin with, which not all of them will have. But that's why there's an, you know, it's important to get the urine checked beforehand, so you have a baseline and then a couple weeks afterwards. 
And then I think your other question was about vegetables. There, there are some vegetables that are alpha, that are more acidifying, if you will, and they include asparagus and garbanzos, a millet. There, there's a whole list of them on Dr. Andrew Knight's website, and it's taken from James Peden's Vegetarian Cats and Dogs book, which um, Andrew Knight's website is veggiepets.info, and that's spelled V-E-G-E. P-E-T-S dot info. And for those of you who signed up on the clipboard, I'll send you the email with that summary so you can reference that. Yes? So I just wanted to say something about comfort because um, last year, it was probably more than a year now, um, my dogs had really bad fleas like they get every year. And um, I gave it to them. And I think um, it's actually for my female, but I gave it to my male also. And I think he only got one dose, and they just got checked like a year later when I had them in. Uh -huh. There's no flea dam. There's no fleas. Period. They've gone over a year. Huh. Like and him, I think just one pill. Uh -huh. Has never gotten fleas since. And, That's great. Um, so the idea of once a month, I. Uh, well, it depends on the dog. I mean, I've seen a lot of dogs who are extremely allergic to fleas. And if they get even one or two flea bites, it sets them off and they scratch like mad, they get hot spots. But not all dogs are allergic to fleas, or cats for that matter. I mean, I've seen the whole spectrum, so it, it really is an individual variation on that. But it seems to have kept the fleas from even getting on them, which is hmm. amazing to me. And even the diet could have an impact with that. I mean, some research has shown anecdotally that the Vegetarian diet can help ward off fleas. So, Dr. Mayfield, you make this the last question. Okay, yeah, Miyoko had a hand in the back. Well, it was about the flea thing. Okay. What I've been using these herbal, it's like an herbal form of frontline. It's made out of, I don't know, herbal extracts or huh. oils. And it's sold by Sergeant and Sentry. You can, and they're really, they sell the whole food. And you put them on the back just like um, you put on frontline. I haven't used frontline in years. Um, and I find like get to put it on like once every few weeks. I forget for a long time, but my dogs rarely get, well, they do get ticks and fleas occasionally, but if I put it on, it seems to work. And I'm just wondering, um, is that, is it possibly, I know the soul is natural, but is there a chance that it's not good for them? I mean, it's, I, yeah, I would have to look at it to see what ingredients were there, but I would well, be a little. Essential oils. Yeah, some of the essential oils, even though they're natural, they're not necessarily safe. Especially with cats, you have to be very careful. And if you're trying to do flea control the total natural way without any kind of chemicals or anything, rather than using essential oils, it would be safer to use diatomaceous earth, which you can get at the nursery store or even the pet food store. Just try to get the food grade kind. There's also the pool kind, which might be okay, but the can food you use grade. It on cats? You can use it on cats. Just make sure that you don't have it billowing up in dust clouds, have it, um, what I suggest is, is putting it on the carpet, letting it sit, and then vacuuming. Vacuuming and environmental control are really key when it comes to flea control, so I think we have to wrap up now, but thank you very much for your attention.